Hi, welcome. This is your host, Vanessa Callahan, founder and lead coach of Raising Our Resilience and our year-long Family Foundations Immersion Program. Uh, really excited. We have a bunch of our graduating class returning for a second and third year. So um, <clears throat> wonderful to have that continuity in our community. Those of you who are listening here, maybe for the first time, are part of our Raising Our Resilience public group called um, Raising Our Resilience Parent Group. Welcome, glad you're here. Uh, maybe you're also checking us out on um, Zoom and or YouTube. So the reason why we get together is that um, myself, my coaches and the folks who find us do believe that parents deserve support and they deserve high quality support based on dozens and um, decades of years of experience, um, you know, kind of distilled into some punchy tips that you can take away and go ahead and give it a try with your family. Not to say that um, we are the experts on your family. You are the experts on your family, but we're here to assist you and support you. And as members join us, we're, um, we ask a question. What is the hardest thing right now about raising kids? Um, what, are you, what are you running into that is maybe holding you back from creating the life and uh, family sort of dynamic um, and relationship that you really would like to have in your life? And so when we um, you know, ask this question, we have folks um, bringing up all kinds of topics related to resilience. And um, it's my pleasure to run through some of those questions today and see what, we, what support we can get to folk, for folks um, as a first, next, a first or next step, yeah? All right, so uh, I just wanna welcome in, it looks like we have Siobhan, one of our alums here on Zoom. Hey, Siobhan. Um, others as well um, on the Facebook group tuning in, say hi in the comments or chat, or if you're in the YouTube watching the replay, you can just drop a comment that says replay. We'd love to see who's here. It makes us feel um, like we're really doing something uh, meaningful here and also helps us to get to know you. Like, oh, you're somebody who's coming and showing up and hanging out with us. Um, that ma that matters. Um, so we'd love to just for you to just say hi in the chat or the comments and uh, we can get rolling here. So the first question we have is from Fernando. Fernando um, joined, the, joined the public group and said, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to show up for my three-year-old while also being clear that hitting or yelling isn't something that we should do to others. And it's really interesting how often we get this kind of request um, around support, which is like, it, to me, this is like, how do I be, how do I show up and be supportive of my child, you know, and make sure that they know that I'm there for them and I feel for them and I'm connected to them, but also establish healthy boundaries and limits, which is, you know, really what the hitting and yelling is about. Um, and the life lessons and the social skills that we end up um, imparting to our children through our parenting. I always say, whether you like it or not, you are an agent of socialization. <laughs> In other words, you are one of the main ways that your child is going to learn the rules, the norms, um, and the best practices of your culture. Um, and so if your family culture is one of, we don't use physical violence, we don't um, harm other people physically or in general, and instead we work out, we work out our problems. Um, that's something you can establish really early on. And it is important to give children other ways of expressing what they need, um, getting their message across besides these physical ways like hitting or kicking or yelling or biting and all the things that kids come up with um, <laughs> as a way of bringing attention to their needs. And so notice I'm saying, I'm not saying, uh, you know, misbehaving. <laughs> I'm using my, this, I'm choosing these, this language very intentionally that they are bringing attention to their needs. One thing we say a lot in the Raising Our Resilience world, especially in our year-long immersion with, with our clients is, are things like, well, this is behavior. And if, if all communication, or, or sorry, if all behavior is communication, what is this behavior trying to tell us, right? Like what is the message behind this behavior or this emotion, that, this emotion plus behavior? So typically, not always, but typically the kind of hitting and yelling is that, that we're, we're getting involved in is very charged by um, an emotion, emotion of anger or frustration or rage or revenge, kind of in that, that um, family of, of emotions. And um, typically they are trying to get across their displeasure 
their frustration, let you know that they don't like something and, and or they want something to be different. And so the very first thing I would say for all of the, for all ages, but especially for the younger kids where, where you wanna start is with something I like to call um, the, like playing the interpreter. So kid is yelling, kid is hitting, and you don't necessarily believe what they say. <laughs> So if they're saying, you're the worst, <laughs> please don't believe that. But what you can read, I kind of think call like pull the curtain be curtain back, you know, and look behind the behavior. What is the need or the message that's coming through? And then you can say back to them, are you trying to let me know that you don't like that? Are you trying to let me know that you want more dessert? <laughs> and I just love the problem. Are you trying to show me or are you trying to tell me? And then take your best guess. What this does is it tells and it establishes to, with, your, with your child that you are willing to play this role of helping them get their message across. And inadvertently, like it's also so that without having to use their hands or teeth <laughs> or fists or feet to tell you that you're shifting to words. Now, a mistake that I want everyone to avoid, it's a very common one, I did it and I still do it when I'm not paying attention, is to um, tell them simply use your words. Now, that does help if you've already gone through a lot of this interpreter kind of ex this interpreter sort of exercise, because there are probably ten main messages that kids are trying to get across when they are upset. You're doing something I don't like. Please stop doing it. Um, I want it and I can't have it, and that's really hard for me. Um, uh, I'm overwhelmed and tired and I don't know how to handle it. So this is, I'm showing you that I'm falling apart. <laughs> I'm hangry, right? Like those kinds of messages. Um, or, um, you know, I, I, need, I need more control. Like you're not giving me enough control over my situation. Um, why, like, why aren't you paying attention to me? I need more attention and so forth, right? So, but once you get through enough times of interpreting their behavior back to them and checking in, did I get that right? Looks like, you know, looks like you're trying to tell me that you don't like this. Looks like you're trying to tell me that you'd like my attention. Looks like you're trying to show me that you're frustrated that she's not listening, listening to you. Um, it looks like you're, uh, you wish, you wish things were different right now, et cetera. And I'm giving you lots of examples because I want you to just hear them and just even be on the receiving end of that and how different that might feel to receive than use your words, right? So once you have a good repertoire of what this behavior might be communicating and you start stumbling upon moments, not every time, because it takes some time to establish this, but you start coming across these moments where they go, mm -hmm, or they soften, or they deescalate, or they cry instead of scream at you because they're actually sad, they're hurt and sad underneath the anger. And you have these little moments where you got through, you got through the behavior. That is one of the top things that you can do to start establishing a better rapport with your kids when they're upset. Okay. And especially young kids, then you can maybe use, <laughs> use your words, or is there something you're trying, I would, I like even better. Is there something you're trying to tell me? Now, when you do this, it doesn't mean you stay there and keep getting hit in the face, right? You still get, you still get to establish like, Ooh, Hey, not okay. And like, I like to move my, my own body away first to see if they can stay there and I can give myself some room so they can't reach me or hit me or kick me or bite me. Um, so like move your own body and go, Hey, whoa, <laughs> and say like, is there something you're trying to tell me here? Or are you trying to show me and fill in the blank for them? Give them the words, see if you got it right. Be genuinely curious about getting it right. That's one of the top tips I can give you around that. Now, this is a way to blend together the two things that Fernando is, you know, has brought to the table as probably one of the hardest skills, but one of the most important skills to hone as a parent which is how do you show up or first of all, staying calm and dealing with your own emotional response. We've got a whole, whole lot of training on that. We spent two months on just emotional mastery and I have a mini course that I bonus in for my year long folks, just on six ways that you can calm your nervous system down in the moment. Because if we're flooded, it, like you can't even remember to say these things, the tools are inaccessible. So that's, that's really like the precursor to what I'm sharing with you. But what I can say is that when you start to build in this, this, this moment of checking in with them, you are showing up for them while also helping them to learn that words 
are where we're going, okay? And that words are what's acceptable. Now, if you go into this and it's not, you're not able to get, get a response, um, they continue to try to hit you, they continue to yell, that's when you do need to have a reasonable reaction, right? So what, what do we want our kids to learn happens when you lose control of your body? Well, other bodies don't wanna be near you because they might get hurt. And so oftentimes taking space is the next step. And I always like to do it with, with hopefulness. Like when, when you're ready, I'll be in the kitchen <laughs> or have a seat here. And when, when you're ready to use gentle hands, you can come to mommy. Um, give them something to do to calm themselves down or to, 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 to take the space um, and let them know when and how they can, you can reunite. And I also like to just check in with them. Are you ready to, are you ready to come and talk about that? You know, um, can you put your hands in my hands now? And we can, we can, we can be good to each other's bodies and keep each other safe. Are you ready to use gentle hands? Would you like a hug? You know, um, and so you can check in with them as you're creating that space. Um, and sometimes 30 seconds later, one minute later, two minutes later, three minutes later, five minutes later in that range. Um, if your child, I just have to put this caveat in there, is doing this five times a day, which is high frequency with a high level of intensity, eight to 10, you know, seven to 10 out of 10. And this has been going on for weeks, get some support. Something's not working. This one tip may not be enough. And I really want you to take it seriously because there's no need to stay in that. That, that, is, that there's something that can shift and it can shift dramatically and quickly over a short period of time. So please get support. And if you, you think you're, you might qualify for support, um, go ahead and take this parenting strength, strengths, strengths quiz. So you can get a sense, I can get a sense and you can get a sense of like what's working, what's not working and um, book a complimentary session with me, 30 minutes, and we'll go over the results and see what's possible for you, okay? And that's not necessarily specifically for Fernando because I haven't been able to ask him how frequently, um, what the duration is to, of like if it's lasting 10, like 15 to 20 minutes consistently or more, um, and if it's been going on for weeks um, consistently over time, like please, please get some support. Okay. And you can also reach out to your, your child's, um, teachers if they have them and just get some perspective on what's working at school for them and try some things at home, but don't stay in that pattern, please. Um, yeah, help is available. Okay. You, you and the, your child or your children don't need to stay in that. Okay. All right. Um, and because it's, it's real, you know, hitting, kicking, biting, those kinds of things, it has a real impact on them. It has a real impact on um, how children cope with, um, you know, kind of being in their bodies and in a schedule and in their family systems, and they're learning a lot. And so if this is happening for weeks and weeks and weeks, you could be like establishing a pattern that will take longer to undo if you don't address it soon. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna move on to something else that's a little different, but similar. Um, this is from Katie. So Katie is sharing with us that um, she's in the middle of dealing with an illness and she liked some support with, with her two and a half and seven year old around how she's going to, uh, like what tools could help them through this difficult time of maybe seeing her, you know, going to the doctor a lot and dealing with maybe medications that will impact her capacity um, and like helping them to kind of wrap their head around what's happening with her uh, without um, unnecessarily scaring them, right? So, you know, a lot of people immediately go towards the, well, you know, the bigger question, which is like, when do we talk about life and death with kids? How do we help them um, sort of prepare for a potential mortality of everything from this goldfish to, um, you know, a parent or um, somebody meaningful in their life. Um, and I'd say at two and a half, there's not a whole lot you need to do there. Okay. Because they are so moment to moment that you, it, it's not like, there's not a whole lot you can do to prepare them for a very big trauma like that. Um, like lo losing someone in, really close to them. So I think it's, it's pretty off the table. And then even for seven-year-olds, I would only address that bigger, harder question if they bring it up. Like 
are you going to die? You know, and then I would talk some science with them. Just let them know um, first two things. First of all, that you have found the best care possible and you're doing everything you can to get better. They really need a lot of reassurance that they're that they don't need to do anything to save your life. Okay, that's really important because kids they don't have a sense of what their power and influence really is. They don't know. Um, and that's why you should never feed into, if you're blank, then I'll get better. Like, don't, don't ever make it their responsibility, like your health, their responsibility or your emotional well-being, like your overall big picture of emotional well-being, their responsibility. They're too young for it. They don't know what to do. And they really will think it's their fault or something bad happens. So please avoid that. That's for everybody to know. Um, but coming back to what, what to do, let them know that um, you have the best care possible and you have and talk, talk about your doctors, talk about the treatments and the research and the breakthroughs, um, talk about other people who have been through this and gotten through it, talk about survivors, talk about people who are um, thriving now. And like, let's say it's something where your hair falls out or you are in a cast or something to say, oh, it's temporary, like the, then the hair grows back. And the cast comes off and I'm able to use my arm again. Kids don't know really like now is now is now is now is now. <laughs> so give them a sense, a little bit of like, this is not the new normal. Um, and we don't need to worry about anything going wrong at this point. Okay. And that you have the best care in place possible. And that is even if you have an illness that is hard to treat, even if, you know, and then you're in the early stages of figuring that out and, and establishing your care plan, just let them know that you are going to, going to find the best people you can. So that's really helpful, um, especially for your seven-year-old who might be asking tougher questions. Um, the other thing is that I would um, make sure that they have a little exposure to what it looks like when you go to the doctor or the hospital, but not too much exposure to it because um, there's a lot that goes on in the hospital and or doctors and doctor environment that causes anxiety for kids um, if it's too unfamiliar or if it's if it's happening all the time. And so I would give it, get, try to find a balance there of how much you're exposing them to sort of the medical environment, make it friendly and make it simple, make it short when they are there and then um, make sure that they, you know, have, have a whole life outside of your illness and your treatments. It's really important, okay? Um, the other thing that's really helpful to do is to talk about how bodies work and how we're built to heal and give examples they know. Like, remember that time you scraped your knee and that hurt, hurt quite a bit and you bled, but then, and then we put on a Band-Aid, an ice pack, and then it was a little scabby for a while. Remember in the bath when it was kind of itchy, um, but then eventually, I mean, look at your knee now, the scab is healed and it's gone. Um, and there's a little, little bit of a mark there we call a scar, but really a scar just is like a memory of what happened. You're, you're actually you know, you're able to use your leg just fine, right? Um, our bodies are, have amazing capacity to heal. And I think that's so comforting. I mean, it even was comforting to me for me to hear that up from my vet about my dog when he almost died recently from a, a dog attack. They said dogs have an amazing ability to heal their, themselves. Like, and I, I, I was like, it was like, it was like balm for like a, like a burn or something. That was just like, it was so soothing. So kids need to hear that. They need to hear that we have great care, that our bodies are resilient and powerful and able to heal so many things. And there's a really, um, your body's gonna really be working hard to, to, to fight off this illness and to, to become um, very healthy once again. Give them an example they understand. The other thing you can do is, um, you know, and if this is something that is a life-threatening illness or terminal, um, potentially terminal, it's, it's, it is really helpful to expand their network of caregivers. Um, so that they have a lot of solid people looking out for them, um, not to like spread it around too much. They still need you to be their primary or you, know, you and your, your co-parents, parent or parents to be your primaries, but give them a sense that like, no matter what, they're going to be loved. They're going to be belong. They're going to have people and make sure that all of those people also are on the same page about how they're, how to speak about your illness, you know, because a lot of them will look kind of like sometimes adults can panic and then say things that they don't really, they wish they hadn't said <laughs> when they're not very prepared about how to talk about hard things with children. So, so, you know, and then the last thing is a more personal decision. Sometimes, and you see these in movies all the time, parents will make this promise. I'll, I'm going to make it like, I'm going to, I'm going to be okay. Now, 
I would much rather see you let them know all the ways they're going to be okay that apply whether or not you survive. No matter what, you will be loved. We're, you know, you have, you have everybody, you know, like enlist your whole community, like your whole, like all your family and community loves you. You will, you will never have a day in your life without being, being loved, you know. Um, I will always be with you no matter what, right? And then you don't have to say in spirit at this point, but you know, if that's something you believe and you really feel and like at least the memories will be there, like just be, be very reassuring. And I, I think it helps to, to just keep it in the realm of what is true no matter what. Does that make some sense? Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing that's true is like, I'm gonna fight this, I'm gonna fight this until the end, babe. I'm not, I'm never giving, I'm never gonna give up. You know, like I'm just, I'm always gonna be, my, I don't care how many doctor's appointments it takes. I don't care what medications I have to take. You know, like really show your fighting spirit and that can be enough too, rather than a promise that, it's, that, you, that you're going to survive. Um, and let them know that they're gonna be okay, no matter what. They're going to be okay. They're going to be loved, and they're going to have um, a community where they belong. Katie, I hope that's supportive, and for anybody else who currently or will in the future be in a situation where um, you're going to be visibly going through something that will put these questions and concerns into the family system, and we wish you the best of luck and speedy healing, Katie, and everyone else um, who can relate to that to that question and that topic. Um, yeah. And uh, let me know if I can say anything you need, Katie, okay? You can drop a question or anyone else on this topic. Um, yeah, just let me know. All right, so we're going to move on to the next question. How do I keep the lines of communication fluid and open with my son, who's 16 years old, while staying away from hel helicopter parenting him? This is another balance question, like Fernando, right? Fernando's like, well, how do I be supportive and, you know, firm, really, about the limits and make sure that my child's learning the lessons they need to learn? This is another dimension of, of balance. Like how do I how do I show interest and be involved without hovering and helicoptering? And if, for those of you not familiar with the helicopter parent, it's like they're always there, always watching in the business and they're not giving the child or teen space to make decisions and live through the results of their decisions, consequences, positive or negative, right? Or neutral. Um, and so instead of, we don't want uninvolvement and we don't want helicoptering. How do we kind of stay in the middle? And I love, Brooke, that you're asking about communication because communication really is what unlocks things for most relationships. And teens need something special. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you what it is, okay? And this is also for all ages of kids. It'll just go better. But I'll tell you, there's nothing quicker. Um, there's no quicker way to sort of create a rift between you and your teenager then behaving in a way that makes, gives them the impression or communicating in a way that gives them the impression that you don't get it. Okay, and I really want you to hear this. So what is the answer, antidote to that? What could turn the corner? It is making sure that you do everything in your power to actually get it. <laughs> now, what I mean by get it is like, get, get what motivates them, get what they care about, get why they make the decisions they do, get why they made the mistakes they made, um, get why they choose the friends they do or the sports or the activities, get why they want to maybe go take a gap year before they go to college, get why they um, like the person they like, right? Now, please don't try to do all those things at once. <laughs> I was giving you more of a list to choose from and pick like one to three at the most. Um, to start with, if you don't already have it. Now, Brooke, it may be very possible that if you're even concerned about helicoptering him, you're already up in the mix quite a bit and quite attuned. So I'm giving you kind of like, okay, don't be uninvolved. Do everything, do, do a lot of like one, two or three things where you're really getting to know them and really understanding what makes them tick. And it, kids at this age also love to like explore things like their Enneagram or their astrology, astrological sign or like um, take a take a strengths quiz or take a um, we have them do that love languages and strengths exploration in my immersion program for example um, for all the family members because it's a getting to know you exercise that's that has like a a framework that you can play with and really really dive into together and see each other in these positive ways or interesting ways so perhaps if you'd like some structure around this um, pick something like that and play with it and kind of explore it as a family. 
and really move to the positive of like what you admire about each other because of this um, new knowledge, right? Um, get interested in something they're interested in is the other hack. And that's like, you know, a way to kind of um, focus in that long list. Like if they're really into Roblox, get into Roblox for the younger kids. If they're, if they're really into Marvel movies, watch three of them with them, you know, commit to that in the next two weeks or three weeks. Um, if they're really into a sport, like go read the rules book, like get to know, understand all the lingo, watch some, watch some professional sports with them, go to their games, interview them afterward. Like what, what were the highlights and lowlights? Oh, and really show some interest. They want to be seen and heard and understood and they don't want to be lectured to. And so, or hovered over where we are generally for tend helicopter parenting tends to instill a lot of anxiety and a lot of pressure into the system of the family. And so instead, so the antidote for that, we're gonna move into that now, is making sure that the interactions you have are mostly encouraging and a lot more listening than telling um, and allowing for there to be some space for them to go do a thing and you have little information about what's happening and you wait for them to share with you what's going on um, rather than poking your nose in it. <laughs> um, now, this is not to say that you can't be close to your kids and know most of what's going on. You can, but they need space too. And they need room for their friendships to kind of grow on their own and you're not facilitated or be the social or architect of their lives. That's the helicoptering part. So I would find at least one area of their life where they, you can give them a lot of privacy. Um, even though there might be some checks and balance, some, some checking in, but um, yeah, like perhaps like they get to go out with their friends after their sporting event. And as long as they're home by a certain time and you know, like you have the tracking location thing on your phone, you're gonna trust them. Um, but I want that to happen alongside you getting to know them and getting this line of communication open where they really feel that you get it. Not only do you get their need for privacy, but you get why they like their friends and you get why they like their sport and those kinds of things. Because oftentimes the advice I hear out there is kind of one or the other. And I really think it's about bringing the techniques together. Just like they're like, oh, what you need is stronger limits. It's like, well, but they also need to feel support. Or what you need is to feel, make sure your kid knows you love and love them and support them and no matter what. And I'm like, yeah, but they also need limits. <laughs> so generally what where we tend to coach towards in this world, in this real world of resilience is towards these kinds of relationships where every, all of that gets to exist. Um, and it's really giving kids what they need. They need space, but they also need to know that you get it. Um, they need privacy, but they also need to know that you're, you are keeping an eye on them in case something goes south. Um, so they need both. And there's ways to bring them in towards the kind of bring them towards the middle. Okay. Um, and this goes for more than just teenagers, young kids too. It just looks different. And teens are especially sensitive to you, whether or not you get it. So if you see your kid scoffing at you and saying, you don't get it, back off a bunch on giving advice and thinking you know everything about the situation and that you're even in the position to give advice. Gather information, back off, give for at least a week if you can handle it, if you can wait. <laughs> and then revisit that topic once they've had a chance to educate you about what you don't get, if, if at all possible, okay? All right, teens, I love teens. I've raised several of them, <laughs> um, my own and other people's teens. All right. Um, I have um, two questions that go well together. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw them, actually three. I love these three. So we're gonna put them all together. Um, this is from Allie Jones, Crystal, Musan, Crystal Sun Blossom, and Cynthia. Um, so the first question is, how do I avoid getting very angry and yelling at the littlest things? We touched on this just a little bit. Um, in uh, when I mentioned that I have a mini course that I go on to send for everybody, right? Where um, all my immersion folks. Um, and if you're curious about this whole immersion thing, um, best thing to do is actually take the quiz <laughs> and um, meet with me. We can chat and see if it's a good fit for you. We have 25 families currently. It looks like we have about six, six families renewing, coming back for another year. Um, and then we have about 12 that are continuing. So we already have a great cohort and then four or five new ones already. So we're likely gonna fill up, um, but we would love to have some new folks on board for the ride because it's gonna be a great a great uh, year and great um, cohort. So let me know that you're interested by taking the quiz and maybe making a note in, in one of the answers that that's something you'd like to chat about. 
Okay, here is the three part question. How do I avoid getting very angry and yelling at the littlest, littlest things, Allie Jones? What are some strategies for keeping calm during stressful situations? We've got Crystal and Sun Blossom with those. And then how do I help my child with self-regulation, Cynthia? So these are all what I would call emotional mastery questions. And by the way, if you're here on Facebook, say hi. There's several people watching that haven't said hello yet. Um, and I know Siobhan's here. Um, and if you have anything to add, Siobhan, having been an alum about what's worked for you around these things, these are some things we've talked through, right? Um, and you've coached, been coached and you've uh, worked through a lot of, a lot of the steps on this. Um, let us know what you think from your perspective. Um, and keeping calm during stressful situations. So whether you're trying to avoid yelling or <laughs> stay calm, um, the advice is really similar. What we're talking about is becoming um, uh, stronger in your self-management skills. And part of self-management is self-awareness. This is coming from the social emotional sciences. Um, and we're you know, trying to put language to this experience so that we can get our cognition involved and maybe have a better opportunity to actually intervene on our own behalf. <laughs> And what that can look like, I like to call them resilience plans, and this is what my clients create, um, and we help them figure it out, is we identify our triggers, we um, notice how our physiology responds to certain stimulus or triggers, and how our psychology, psychological state tends to pattern or, or respond to certain stimulus and triggers. And then as we become more aware of that, we get to do things like be able to know what our tells are, that we are about to go into a zone of being flooded. And then when we're flooded, you know, acting from this place of anger. So we might yell or shutting down and feeling like really shaky. Um, we want to avoid that, right? So how can we avoid that? Um, is to really build in a lot of practice of like naming it to tame it, like um, Dr. Daniel Siegel and um, a lot of folks in the positive discipline space really to say, like name the emotion, use that I statement, um, tune into your body, where is it? And then you basically emotion coach yourself. Now, if you have no exposure to this friends, this is not gonna be second nature, okay? And I need you to stop being hard on yourself if you are somebody who maybe you would say, I have a quick temper or, um, you know, I'm very sensitive. Now. Those things might be true, but they're not necessarily bad things, friends. These are things that we are hardwired to be. Um, and they actually make us more responsive to situations than other people because we pick up on things sooner. We're affected by them sooner. We do something about things sooner than others. And so sometimes we're exactly what's needed. <laughs> okay, so let's stop making it wrong. Please, no shame around this, no guilt, okay? Um, and if you'd like to feel more in control of your response, there are things you can do. I'll tell a little story. So I've had um, several clients come to me and say, I'm yelling in the mornings. I'm yelling in the middle of the street to mom, my daughter. And this is exactly the opposite of how I want to be. I'm, I'm really triggered by my kid. Um, just the sound of my kid's cry is triggering for me. And we need to get down with what is going on for you. And it does take some, sometimes some mentorship, support, some therapy, some coaching. And within three to six months, you can absolutely bring that nervous system baseline down where you have a calmer response and get some tools that work for you specifically to um, regulate yourself and also teach those tools to your kids. Now, if you've never heard of this before, you know, um, it might feel a little bit daunting, but it is absolutely, absolutely possible for you to get, regain control, um, bring in tools and skills that your kids can also use and benefit from. As a matter of fact, there's like six specific breathing tools that at least one of them your kids will probably like at some point um, that I'll be rolling out next month um, as we build up to uh, a, a bigger session on ending power struggles. Um, that will be a public webinar. We're just, we're going to announce that um, at next week. But I want you just to like, first of all, know that just like you can learn a skill, like 
how to play the piano or a new sport or um, how to cook a new meal. You can hack your nervous system and learn new strategies to be calmer, to have less of a, of a triggering um, experience in certain circumstances. And it is so good for you. And it is so good for your kids to see you grow this way. Okay. So um, if, if in any way you're telling a story that I'm just like this and there's nothing I can do, I'm going to call, I'm going to just go ahead and call BS on that. Okay. Let's just call BS on that. Whatever, whatever um, source of that story has been influencing you in your life, I need you to put up a hand and go, nope. <laughs> no, I'm not the sensitive one and that's a bad thing or no, I'm not quick tempered and that's that's how it has to be. Um, I would absolutely have an intense emotional response around upset kids. And I was able to train my nervous system to be calm and get beyond calm and actually go, oh, this is an opportunity to help this kid. And maybe even walk towards the meltdown with like some confidence and some interest of a curiosity like oh how can I help right and we can all get there to some to, to our own to our, our own degree right um so for example Siobhan says name it to tame it has helped me in so many ways I'm going to say that again name it to tame it which is when you name an emotion to so kind of tame it to kind of get your mind involved and kind of get back into control and have a flash of self-awareness I like to say has helped her in so many ways it still helps her and her son through hard times, she says. Also walking away and giving yourself time to cool down. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it can be that simple. Once you try a bunch of things, you find what works and you do it. And you do it consistently. And then now this is just the way that you kind of handle things instead of escalating things. Yeah, making things worse. Yeah, good. Nice, Javon, thank you. And I'm so proud of everything that you've learned in your progress. Um, Siobhan is a very avid student. She came to a lot of the trainings and really put in the work. So congrats. And I love that this is, this is something that's carried forward for you, Siobhan. Really good to hear. Yeah. It's so powerful, right? Um, sometimes the simplest things are the most powerful. However, different tools for different folks. So that's really what I like to do. I like to help people find the tools that actually work for them. Because there is so much advice out there. Should you be doing mindfulness meditations or doing breath work or should you be doing more yoga or should you be, um, you know, uh, in, in some kind of cognitive behavioral um, protocol or should you be, you know, changing your diet? Like there's just so many possible ways to tackle this. And I would say headline is get started. Don't wait. If you have identified this, this as an issue for you or a area of struggle and get mentorship, it doesn't have to be with me and my coaches, but I sure think that we have a lot to offer. So, you know, if this is something you've been wanting support with and you'd like to get out of a pattern, take the quiz and sign up for a session. Let's talk. Okay. Um, and Cynthia, the best way to help your child with self-regulation is to master it for yourself for, um, alongside your child. I almost said first, and that would be wrong. Alongside your child. They like just be in the family discovery process of finding out what works for each of you and let each of you have maybe different strategies. I had a, a, um, I have a client who has two kids um, about three years apart and they just keep growing. We're in a third year of mentorship and now the youngest one is almost five and we're both like, what? She was just a toddler. But um, she noticed that different things work for each of them at, and sometimes at different times. And being able to name that and not make that wrong, that like, oh, well, what? you know, one of you wants to jump up and down the trampoline to get your energy out and the other one wants to snuggle up with a book um, with me and, and saying like, that's okay. Yeah, you need to get some energy out and you need some, some snuggles to kind of like feel close and, and um, you know, have something to put your mind on so you forget about the bad spider situation or whatever. Um, and she's fully embraced that and it's done such wonders because her kids have really different temperaments and different resilience plans. They just need something different when uh when they're upset um and sometimes at different different days you need different things so like we've created a whole calm down zone with all these filled with all these things and they have options too options are great so how do you teach help your child with self-regulation to take it on as a family project um this parent did a smart thing and she would put herself into positive timeout in the in their calm down corner and kind of explore the tools while her little one was watching her 
do I think reading a book is going to be helpful or do I think jumping on trampoline is going to be helpful? I'm leaning more towards a book. Let's see how that helps. And then she'll start reading and then she'll stop midway and go, how am I feeling? I'm feeling a little calmer. And then the little one's kind of watching like, oh, you know, and take it on as a family project. Okay. Yes. I love it. So this is for all of you, all of us. So we, we can approach a lot of things as a family and it's really encouraging and it takes a lot of the shame out of it. So I think a lot of times kids are kind of ashamed that they're the one who's being redirected to be calmed down. Um, we make it kind of punitive sometimes. And if we can pull that out and just say, look, we're all human. We all need stuff. And we're all going to figure, we're going to figure it out together. And that's the good thing because then we know ourselves better and we're going to have a better time with in life. Yeah. So it's not a problem. It's an opportunity. And we can frame it that way in our own minds and take that on as a project. It makes a huge difference. All right, so now we have Jessica Marie asking about sibling rivalry. How do you deal with it? Well, Jessica, this is such a good one. This is one of our seven pillars. So we've had, we've already covered a lot of emotional mastery. One of our seven pillars in the Raising Our Resilience Family Foundations Immersion, the year-long program, is conflict resolution and repair. And so sibling rivalry is where we get to find out what skills we have. <laughs> and or power struggles between caregiver and child. It doesn't have to be siblings. But if you find yourself in a power struggle, it's a kind of conflict, everybody. And if you find yourself with hurt feelings that linger, there's repair needed, everybody. So <laughs> just being able to name it as that, like, oh, we have a conflict and we need to repair this and we need to take some time to do some repair. That is wildly helpful for siblings. Just telling them to get along better or telling them to stop fighting really isn't enough. It doesn't quite actually nail down what is needed and doesn't really completely reflect the situation. So I really like the um, language around that, around, oh, there's a conflict. Oh, there's a problem to solve. Oh, we need to, it looks like there's something we need to address that they didn't resolve that somebody's still upset about. Because one of the best ways to um, perpetuate sibling rivalry is to skip the repair step. So one thing you might be looking at um, in every single one of you that has to well, sibling rivalry and sort of uh, really coming up to the top of the, your list of pain points, um, how and when do you build in time for you to repair with your kids or for your kids to repair with each other? Is it even built in yet? And if it isn't, if it is, is it working for you? Um, and if it's not built in yet, why might you be avoiding that or skipping that step? And the simple answer can be, I didn't grow up with that. I don't know how to do that, right? That's not something we do in our family. Apologies and making it up to each other and fixing mistakes and checking in. Are we resolved? Is there anything else we need to talk about? You know, me might even have a kind of a strong reaction to even that suggestion. That to me just points to a skill gap and it's just a lack of experience with something that is actually a human need. We need to know that we still love, we're still loved and we still belong. And if repair doesn't happen, it can perpetuate stories that we, we aren't loved or we don't belong or um, that this person is an enemy instead of um, a resource in our lives for entertainment and joy and fun and learning and competition in a healthy way, which is what siblings can be. So I would be really taking a look at like what, what have you tried? What's working? What's not working? And where might you be avoiding something? And why are you avoiding it? And there are things you can teach and do. I, for three years, uh, or would have students for three years and I, um, in my six to nine-year-old classroom. And I highly value conflict resolution, problem solving, and repair. It's something that I taught explicitly to the kids. As a matter of fact, I would use Jane Nelson's four problem solving, solving suggestions and would help the kids come over and be like, oh, there's a problem. Have we identified what it is yet? Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Is do, you know, this person's doing this, this person's doing that. Kids will, like what, what a kid would come and like tattle on. She won't let me have a turn or she's not listening when I tell her to stop or he's, he's um, being too rough or um, he won't, he won't um, give me any space, right? These are common things. Um, and you can say, okay, so you've identified the problem. And then you can say, how would you like to... <laughs> How would you like to try and solve this problem? We often skip that step and just go in and get involved or tell them to get over it, right? 
because we're busy, we're stressed, we're tired, we're avoiding it, whatever the reason. So actually giving them ways to solve those problems is so empowering. And I went from six-year-olds when they come into my classroom going tattling and whining about it and like, or, 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 or like not doing anything and just holding a grudge or then being fearful of this person because it's unresolved to um, collectively going, I think we have a problem. And then walking over to the poster with four problem solving suggestions and say, which one do you think we should try? <laughs> and then they would sit down and pass a talking object back and forth and try to talk it out. Or they would brainstorm a list of possible solutions. Or if they ran out of ideas, they would put it in the class meeting or in your case, family meeting agenda eventually. I know your little one is very little, Jessica. So eventually, this is where we're building towards. And then eventually, eventually they're running the meetings. I brought a family from um, the six-year-old hitting the nine-year-old and the nine-year-old slamming doors and calling them names to six-year-old putting his own agenda items on the agenda for the family meeting and asking, can we, can we move it to a sooner date so we can talk about this? So we often, oh my gosh, underestimate what kids are ready for in problem solving and repair. They're actually craving it from us. So please, please start bringing in these tools and skills, whether it's through a mentorship program like mine or another um, resource. It doesn't have to keep going this way. Um, the other thing is that you may be putting them in stressful situations without realizing it. So I like to look at things like, what are your expectations? Like, can a seven-year-old really manage an hour alone with a two and a half year old on their own? My answer, my quick answer is, or six year old, no, <laughs> no. Like I wouldn't do that in the classroom, right? But could, could we help them build up to that starting with 10 minutes and then 20 and then 30? Absolutely. Could we do that over three months, six months? Yes. By the end of a year, could things look really different? Absolutely. Um, are there healthy ways for your six year old to get space from your two and a half year olds? Completely. Like, is there a way we can structure that? 100%. <laughs> Is there a way we can keep a toddler busy so the six-year-old can have that space? Yes. Like there's so much possible here. So Jessica Marie, I would really encourage you to take me up on the free session and just go ahead and take your quiz. Okay. Um, and anyone else who's curious about these kinds of things, because we can get a lot done in 30 minutes and see if it's something, a project that you wanted to continue on with support. Okay. With community support and for my team of coaches and myself. All right. Last but not least. So Joan. Yay, Joan! Joan and um, and her co-parent Isaac just signed up actually to be in um, mentorship. I'm doing a coaching intensive, um, and we'll be also joining in with the uh, immersion folks. So those of you who are in the immersion, yeah, we're going to be welcoming in Joan and Isaac very soon next month. And this is a question you were asking when you were just uh, kind of getting to know the community before you signed up, Joan. You said something about wanting to navigate through times when you think your children might be behaving intentionally difficult. So willful resistance. Yay, Cynthia. Yay. I just talked about your piece. So um, make sure you listen to the recording if you um, didn't catch it. Otherwise, let us know if you have any fault questions or takeaways. Let us know. Um, we really went, went on about um, the self-regulation stuff quite a bit. So glad you're here. Uh, good job. <laughs> I know it's not easy making the time. All right, so back to Joan. Be willful, willful, willful refusal is one way to put it. Um, or uh, instigation, like purposeful instigation, <laughs> where they're like trying to make something um, more difficult because of the reaction they get, because of the entertainment factor they get from our reactions. There's so many reasons why kids will do things, at least partly on purpose. Although usually there's also some like unconscious or subconscious driver, like they might not be able to say, I'm doing this to get your attention. But when you say it to them, this is one of the strategies of mistaken goals of behavior um, by Rudolf Dreikers, for example. Um, he says, you know, it can be revenge or um, like they, they assume inadequacy. So they're expressing their insecurity or more likely power, a power grab or, um, you know, trying to get your attention. Um, also, I think this is mostly about your four, four or four and a half year old, um, Joan. They're trying to figure out the rules of engagement and they cannot help themselves. Most of, well, a lot of these kids who you would say like are willfully refusing or you know, being intentionally um, instigating, 
um, behaving intentionally, <laughs> difficult, they're testing, testing. And they especially test the parent or caregiver who has not been clear in the past. Here's an example. In the back of their mind is a little program running that's saying, well, they gave in once, I wonder if they'll give in again. Maybe if I whine long enough, they'll, they'll give me what I want. <laughs> um, maybe if I ignore them enough times, they'll do it for me. Um, because that happened yesterday. Uh, maybe if I, if I throw a fit, I um, can get out of this thing I don't want to do. Yeah. They want to know the answers to these questions. Like, I wonder, I wonder what will happen if I whine, if I refuse, if I ignore, if I throw a tantrum. And it's not like they're like maniacally pl plotting in the corner how to ruin your day, you know, typically. <laughs> if that's happening, then, you know, we have a different conversation to have. But generally, it's just that this child is incredibly bright. They really want to understand the rules of engagement and they can't help. They're compelled to get the answers to those questions. So what's the remedy to that? You can probably guess what it is, but it's easier said than done. It's consistency, clarity and consistency, okay? Yeah, nice, Joan. Oh, I'm glad you're here, Joan. Hey, um, Joan's saying we had a period of the youngest having pee accidents that seemed very avoidable, for example. Okay, Whew. I love this example, Joan, and we're gonna get into this more in our coaching, which we're, we're kicking off very soon, I'm excited. In the meantime, here's some food, food for thought around this. There's, there's, there are very few things that are more powerful that the kids can be more powerful about than what goes in and out of their bodies. So struggles like eating um, and peeing and pooping are at the top of a lot of these lists now. So that being said, power can be a really big mistaken goal and a driver of this behavior, power oh, when I do this, then I don't have to go to the toilet and someone cleans me up. <laughs> um, even puppies have protest peeing. <laughs> they don't like a thing and they'll go pee on it, you know? Um, so there's some instinct around peeing in particular for mammals, I believe. <laughs> I've noticed the connection. Um, so what are some ways that we could make your little one powerful around potty time? Maybe they get a lot of choices within limits of um, what like like what story is that they're going to be uh, listening to while they go poop you know um whether they have help taking their pants off or not um whether or not um they um uh, they flush or you flush like just any kind of powerful choices to build in sometimes that just gives them enough of the power around potty um the other thing can be that you agree on how you're going to prompt them to go pee so that they don't feel pushed around because sometimes when kids feel bossed to go to the bathroom, they'll just do it a different way, which might mean a potty accident or peeing in the corner instead of in the toilet. I've cleaned it up. I know, I know all about it, okay? Um, or holding poop all day. So uh, I just helped a family where the child was already almost six and was still not pooping in the potty. And we also needed to do something called scaffolding where we broke it down into smaller steps because going from Pooping in a diaper to pooping in the potty was too much of a leap. And he also didn't get a sense of like, why should I, right? And even though they explained why they should, they had to actually build in a reward system to get him going. And once they got him going, he was very motivated intrinsically from within to make the progress to the final step. And he was very proud. And that was the real reinforcer, right? He was like, ah, oh, I did it, right? And now he's giving advice to his younger sibling, his sister, how she should go potty. And it was like, oh. so. There's a lot of empowering things about that, right? Breaking it down to steps, giving him, helping him set goals, helping him, celebrating when he met goals that were in reach and um, scaffolding for him was a support piece. So power is one of them and potentially like there's something missing in terms of the scaffolding of steps, like you're, like you're kind of all or nothing with them, not meaning to, so that's one of them. The last one, um, the, uh, sorry, the last one, the other one, of the mistaken goals that I think stands out here is attention. Kids can get a lot of attention when they keep doing something they're not supposed to do. And so even though it sounds like this parent was giving a lot of attention in the reward system, she gave almost no attention when he had an accident and when it didn't go right. Instead of like, 
oh no, honey, not again. Oh, now we're going to have to clean up. And Sometimes that works the first time and they feel so like, oh, this is a bad thing. I should avoid it and I shouldn't do this. But if you're in a pattern where you, you bring it up like that and then they keep doing it, it could be attention seeking as well. And sometimes it's both. Yay, how fun for us. <laughs> so there's a lot of remedies to it. I just gave you a couple of ideas. Um, Cynthia's saying that she understands because her five-year-old still wears pull-ups and she'll pee on the bed while sleeping. So I just put a pull up to avoid a wet bed and I hate a wet bed, yeah. So yeah, sometimes that's just what you need to do. And then you can work towards, I would say scaffolding, which means breaking down to smaller steps and doing some training on each step or acclimating back into, you know, not needing a pull up at night and um, maybe setting a goal too of like by the end of summer, going into the next school year, we're gonna, we're gonna graduate from pull ups. Um, so there's a way to kind of plan that all out which I'd be happy to support you with if you'd like to take me up on the 30 minute session. You just needed to, I'll, I'll put the link in again since some of you are, um, weren't here for that comment. Um, this is an opportunity to take this free quiz, identify strengths, let me know what you'd like to work on and sign up for a, session, a coaching session, a 30 minute complimentary session. And if the times don't work there, let me know, just DM me or um, contact me, okay? All right, so Joan, <laughs> why I love your question is that we can all relate to it. And I think, again, if we go circling back to the very beginning of the hour, when someone was asking, it was Fernando asking about hitting and yelling, all behavior is communication. So in this case, with a younger kid, four or so, even early, you know, younger, peeing on purpose, um, doing the opposite of what you say, um, all kinds of protest behaviors, all kinds of refusals and ignoring and things like that. Just be like, I would play with this question. What is this, what is this behavior trying to tell me? Like, what, are they, what, what is the message behind this behavior? If all behavior is communication, are they saying, pay attention to me. I want more power. I don't like it. Um, give me more. Um, I don't know how to do this on my own. Um, you're, being, you're, you're putting too much pressure on me. Or um, I don't see you enough. You know, like there's so many possible messages. And I would just be kind of, like, just kind of get curious and see what comes to you. And I will also, Joan, especially since we're going to be working together, I will help you tease that out and, and see if we can not get some validation for these messages and other ways for your child to um, relay that message than these kind of like protest behaviors. Sound good? All right. So that rounds out our Ask Me Anything. Really great questions. Let me just double check that I didn't miss any questions, but I think I got to everybody. Uh, let me just make sure. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We got everybody. Thank you so much again for allowing us to coach you in this format and give you some, some perspective um, as a community. This is what it feels like to be in a coaching session where there's all the side door coaching going on. We have the monthly twice a month in the immersion, which Siobhan knows and Joan knows, but some of you may not be aware. And this year-long program is so good. It's so fun. We, we work on emotional regulation, emotional mastery, motivation, mastery, conflict re resolution and repair. We also look at routines and how um, to build really healthy boundaries and limits and the balance between support and demand in those spaces. And then we even help you to build really positive relationships, not just with your kids, but with other caregivers in a way that really brings out each of your strengths and gets you on the same page about raising kids, which is huge. So if any of that is calling to you, again, just take the quiz. We'd love to see you check it out. and. Um, the other, the other on purpose stuff, Joan. I see that comment. That will surely come up. We're going to, we're going to work through and get you, get you lots of perspective on what might be communicating, what you might be communicating. There, there tends to be themes, and we, we, we figure them out within three to six months. Yeah, and that's that'll help a lot. All right, y'all. So again, if you're interested in um, learning about the immersion, the next cohort starts in July. We'll be studying together July through June, and kicking off with a really great event called the Motivation Mastery Weekend. If that's something that's of interest to you. Please indicate that, let me know by taking the quiz and we can have a chance to not only give you a 30 minute complimentary session in the next few weeks, but also explore if the immersion cohort that's kicking off and filling up um, is the right fit for you, if uh, either now or in the future. All right, lots of love to each and every one of you. Good work today. Take care, Siobhan, good to see you. Keep, see you soon, Joan. Um, lots of love to each and every one of you and we'll be back for more um, support in two weeks. Next, next week is Memorial Day, so we're taking a Monday off, and we'll be back in two weeks for our next topic for 15-minute sessions of Monday Mindset Moments.
Bye, everybody.